I want to get into this because I want to I want to get into some ministry. We want to be praying for some people tonight. We didn't come here tonight to do a sermonette. Make you all feel fuzzy. I wasn't this morning either. Oh, who was here for this morning? Oh, oh, heard so good. Oh, if, if you weren't here this morning, you might be new here and like, what? People came back. I know people went to all three. It's hungry. You might have been like, what was that confession of faith about? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's going to crack something open. So listen, this morning, there was a pastor from New Zealand, 40 years of ministry, that brought such a word this morning, don't be a bonsai tree. And I'm telling you, if you want to grow as a human being, you want to listen to that message. And so do your soul a favor and go download that. If you don't have our C3 app, get that bad boy, listen to it. And then after you listen to that one, I want you to go back and listen, if you weren't here, for my wisdom ladder, because this is kind of part two of that. And this one really comes around, really what I want to talk about is um, just around a spirit of fear. And when I love it, I, I love Googling just if I was ever on a game show, you know, I want to I make sure I can get a, you know, lifeline or Google some facts. So I was trying to get through some of the questions. You know what the number one question that a lot of people have? What came first, the chicken or the egg? Wow. That matter. <laughs> You're bitter about it. We'll pray for that. But I, I love it is even Aristotle, the great philosopher, this was one of the first questions he tried tackling. <laughs> he tried using logic around chicken or the egg, and I was listening to all these theories, and it was amazing that depending on which worldview you take really determines your answer. And evolutionists assert that the birds evolved from reptiles over millions of years, so reptiles eventually lay the egg that hatches the chicken. So as far as they're concerned, the egg came first. But then you talk to creationists, and on the other hand, and they dismiss that argument completely, and they're in favor of the chicken taking the first place position. And so it's amazing that there's this massive Facebook page that even wants to sit around and argue. I'm thinking to myself, how do they have time for that? But then I don't know what's around these chickens. I'm almost like, the second most answered question is, why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> the people got problems. We're not even farmers and they're asking questions. But everyone seems to be in agreement to get to the other side. Thank goodness. You might be wondering... What's this all about? Well, I have a goal tonight. This is to learn and get set free so that everything you ever want to be, do, and have is only going to be on the other side of the road of fear. And I want to let you know that this is something that fear is an emotion that was created to pretty much, like, don't go, if you're going to go to the cliff, you want to get a little like, whoa, that's called wisdom. But it's amazing as I've been doing this study of fear, it's really a two-sided coin. And some of it, everyone wants to blame the devil on it. But really, we have our own role to play. And so I want to get into that night. See, most of us live two lives. We live the life we live, obviously. And then there's the unlived, the magical life hidden deep within us. And it's about what is it going to take to unlock that? So what compels people to be fearful, to think and act like part of the herd, to live this entire lifetime with very little to show of it? One of the reasons I wanted to do a deep dive study on this tonight and then get into some ministry time and really pray to break some stuff off is that so many people get stuck in living their best life due to fear. And it really comes around at some of my pastoral care meetings, I hear the same thing over and over again. But the root of it is this root of fear. See, we can have thoughts of fear that start to overwhelm us. And if we let those thoughts go too far, we give a foothold for the enemy to get in. And there is such a thing as a spirit of fear. If you've never heard of this book, it's called A More Excellent Way, Be in Health. It talks about how there's over actually 88 references of just the spirit of fear causing hundreds of diseases in our body due to a spirit of fear. Wow. 
But there has to be an agreement somewhere along the way that we came into agreement with that starts this trickle-down effect. Could have been those four espresso shots, but <laughs> not judging, not judging. I love this. I was reading this. It says, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? Die and go to heaven? So what's your problem? God doesn't need you in heaven. You are no earthly good if you go to heaven prematurely. The Lord does not need you there. If you get there too soon, he's going to ask you, what are you doing here? <laughs> and it goes into the stress physiology of living a life in fear. America is plagued by fear. You're afraid of your mother, your father, your husband, your wife, your children, your boss, disease, death, tomorrow, man, rejection, failure, abandonment, trains, planes, buildings, fear of this, fear of that. It is all over the place, isn't it? Phobias, germs, people phobias, food phobias goes on and on to talk about it all. One of an incredible book to read, it gives you prayers that if you're struggling with this anxiety, this thing, that thing, how to pray it off you. And I think it's really important to know, I'm gonna give you some scripture and then we're gonna uh, get into this thing. But Deuteronomy 31.8 says, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. So if, if God has to tell you don't be afraid, guess what he knows you're gonna be? Do not be discouraged. Well, you're going to be discouraged. Yep. He's telling you not to be. In 2 Timothy 1.7, I have this on mirrors everywhere. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Well, if he gave us this thing, here's, there's two parts to this, this is that we're going to stuss tonight. Number one. This, I'm going to go over eight things to recognize, and they're going to be quick, and you're not going to write them down, I promise. <laughs> they are, what can we do? And the second part is, what can God do? So because that's the two parts of this. If you keep perpetually living in fear and coming into agreement with fear, you give an open door to the devil to come in, and what's God going to be doing? Is He's got to keep coming back around, keep getting you set free, keep getting you delivered, which he will, but it's self-responsibility at some point. And so if I can help you recognize, set up the alarm system in your own personal life, I promise you, you're going to live a different life than you may be living right now. So in short, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. It always has and it always will. I say it all the time. Fear is an unworthy of your companionship. It's an unwanted visitor. It becomes a tormenting spirit if you entertain it in your house long enough. So you might be wondering, you know, what does this have to do with God in Hollywood? Well, I like Batman. Probably because my little boy likes Batman. But I love the fact that fear is never a reason for quitting or second-guessing yourself. But what happens is the enemy comes in and creates self-doubt. And it becomes a stronghold. What's amazing is the world's answer, get this stat, in the United States alone, 40 million people suffer with fear and anxiety and depression. The world's view is to counsel and meditate. And I'm not, I'm not coming to tell you my thoughts on that, but I'm telling you, you can't medicate a demon. I was raised in a church where you're like, whoa, what does that mean? Well, most of my life I was raised in a good Bible teaching church, but they never told me to empower me to take authority here we are, a Holy Spirit-filled church. What does that mean? We want you to operate in the gifts. We want to pray for you. We know that you can live your best life if you have the Holy Spirit, your helpmate, helping you to take victory in every one of these aspects. <coughs> so if you haven't been prayed for or you're not operating in those gifts, you will be tonight. If not, take the Pathways courses. Or come to Tuesday morning men's prayer at 530. Or Thursday, go to a seven or nine. It's like uh, choose your own adventure on Thursday for the ladies. <laughs> but I think it's super important because if we can take self-responsibility, we're going to take care of a lot of our own issues. And tonight, there will be some people getting set free and delivered and prayed for. And it's powerful. You may feel like you want to get up right now and leave out of here when stuff starts stirring. Listen, I knew all day stuff was starting to stir. I knew all week. There was some spiritual warfare this week when I got the download, 
when I started pressing in and praying around this spirit of fear, I saw some things get agitated. I went for a nice haircut this week at Mr. Brown's and came out to get myself a sandwich, and I was just praying in line, and all of a sudden, the person in front of me turned around and scowled at me. He couldn't hear me. He was just praying, but I felt something in my spirit when I was in this sandwich shop, and all of a sudden, this guy turned around. Then I looked at his girlfriend, glasses on, black and blue all over her face, and I felt this spirit, and I knew it was a spirit of fear, rise up in that place. But I want to tell you that I've recognized it before. I've prayed for people. And I finally, all week long, I got sick of a toleration of being around some people that I care about that are operating in fear, yet they don't know it because they're not listening to what they're saying. They're not hearing because they've been around it so long, it's now become a familiar spirit. And if I can empower my church, our people, our flock, our family to be an alarm system for one another, that's where iron sharpens other one another and in that that is where we can hold each other accountable in prayer not judgment in prayer to make sure that we don't give a foothold I then went outside to eat my nice sandwich and that couple was sitting right four you know tables down as I started praying in my spirit this guy whipped around and stared right at me and then I started going oh dear lord what would this look like if I got arrested before the Sunday I preach <laughs> Because I felt everything in me. And I watched as he was berating this girl, calling her name, saying stuff to her. And I was sitting there almost shaking. I could, you could ask my wife, I couldn't finish my sandwich. I got up and I was just like, just walk to your truck. Be a good pastor. Walk to that truck. Finally, I walked by him and said, don't talk to your girl that way. And then, boom, and this guy went crazy. And it manifested. And I realized, man, I probably, she goes, just leave, he's crazy. I'm thinking to myself, you're with him. Thinking to myself, where's my friend Weatherford right now? Because he would not be talking to me this way. I would have been like, you would just be down. But, you know, it's like cooler heads prevailed. But listen, this thing is more, that, that's like an, a, a large experience. But when you operate in fear, there's a fruit of it. You either have the fruit of the spirit. And there's different fruits in the Bible. You saw it on the women's video. And I, and I think when we study fruits of the Spirit, when we study the fruit that God wants us to walk in, if you're not showing that fruit, then let me tell you, there's an aspect of fear that is grabbing onto you, and I want to expose it tonight. So what exactly is fear costing you? What are the consequences of keeping your dreams on hold? So listen, yeah, it's good to train with Batman. But what I wanted to point out was Bruce Wayne as a child made an inner vow. And he lived a life in anger, thinking that was going to serve him. He then went on to get trained that now his whole, he was exposing a weakness, that he had that inner vow. What happens is we can all make inner vows with, them, with ourselves. It's amazing. I was sharing with somebody, like in eighth grade, I had my girlfriend break up with me. I mean, so trivial. I can't believe she'd do that. <laughs> but she was going on to high school. Why would she want to date into junior higher? But I turned it into like this rejection thing. And you know, I, could I turned it in, not the devil. I turned it into this thing that became a belief. That then that belief became an inner vow when I gave power to the enemy to then rule and reign and wreak havoc and maybe every other relationship. But it was me having an inner vow that created the unwinding. So I'm going to read just a couple things. And I call this the fruit of the enemy that I want you to recognize, I do not want you to write these down, but when we pray, there's eight of them, I want you to hear something. Because anything that tweaks you, twists you, fires you, that's an agreement that you've made somewhere, otherwise you wouldn't recognize it. When I have people that get all fluffy around the tithe or offering or why do we come around giving every time, it's mostly they're in a place of their own funk and their own belief it has nothing to do with what the word of God says because if they were in alignment with it, we would see the fruit of it. Right. But if they want to grip onto it, they get angry. Like he's, all he said was, your, it's your dad's fault. And then he went ballistic because there was something, a struggle that he was unwilling because his identity is, I created myself because of this inner vow. This is why I'm on this purpose journey, but it was based in anger and a wrong belief. 
What happens is whenever something challenges you, there's something in you we need to look at. So I'm going to read these. You just write the number down because when you come up for prayer, you're going to break that interview. I want to break number one. I want to break number five. It doesn't matter what it is. God knows what it is, and we want to break those agreements. Now, are there more than eight? There's probably hundreds. These are the ones that God highlighted it to me. So you just listen to them, resonate, and then we're going to, I'm going to teach one little Bible lesson to give you reference, and then we're going to go into some prayer. Does that sound good? And the, and the truth is you can stay in the seat, and that's fine. This is the altar for a reason. This is where lives get altered boldness and breaking that spirit is saying, I'm done with this. I want different fruit in my life. I'm going to go down on that altar as a statement to the devil. No, no, no. I'm not giving you any more territory. So let's read number one, a diminished self-worth and personal value. Eventually you will come to think of yourself as a kind of person who is undeserving of success. It's amazing when we would read that statement, all I do is win. When we started these declarations, I would watch people physically not be able to say, all I do is win. They didn't believe in that. Whatever their theology was around this, all I do is win, it's just a statement. Why are you getting so torqued about it? Oh, I don't know if God wants me to win. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Then you're not reading what he says about that you were creating the image and the likeness. We have to re-identify your view and your filter of what you think of your heavenly father. And we want to uproot that. What happens is you, when you begin to lose faith in yourself, it leads to a downward spiral of psychological devastation that is extremely difficult to overcome. That's number one. Don't take notes on that. Just write one if that resonates with you. Two, we have become imprisoned by the comfort zone. Adapting to your comfort zone creates habits of thinking and acting that become dysfunctional and debilitating. By remaining in your comfort zone, you choose to incarcerate rather than liberate your talents, skills, hopes, and your dreams. Three, perpetuation of pain. Avoiding the challenge of running from your fears only achieves self-sabotage and the perpetuation of pain, which leads to a cycle of failure and disappointment. Usually, failure's high price is commonly imposed through bankruptcy, unemployment, depression, poor grades, stress, loss of a girlfriend or boyfriend, physical or psychological pain. I had to overcome that. Four, Character assassination, which is inner vows or agreeing with things spoken over or at you. By allowing fear to control your life, the devil will convince you that you are a sad consequence of neglect, excuse making, self pity, poor character, lack of direction, and a courage deficit. We break that tonight. Number five, you have development, you've developed a quitter reputation. Quitting is a habit. And it's the path of resistance and tolerance to pain, inconvenience and sacrifice. Once you develop a quitter reputation, your options will be limited. Your reputation has become questioned and your future will be in jeopardy. This is becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Number six, we feel as though we have no purpose or little to no impact. We don't understand what we have for our life. The devil says you're either a remarkable or you're irrelevant. And by embracing fear and running from a challenge, you'll have little to show for your existence in the precious time that you were given. Most people will make the statement, I think it's just too late for me. Yeah. Yeah. Number seven, you have limited earning ability, so you negatively impact your financial opportunities by choosing fear over courage. You'd rather stay in that job than go after your dream. Fear compromises your quality of life. It undermines your ability to provide for your family. It turns your golden retirement years into a time of fear, uncertainty, shame, and regret. By not actively stretching yourself and rising to meet a challenge, you will survive and never know what it means to enjoy safety, security, and peace of mind. And the last one, you become a subconscious traitor. By refusing to face your fears, you, by default, choose to betray, only resist, and rebel against any opportunity and chance for a better life. You take yourself out of church. You take yourself out of connect groups. You, you are your own worst enemy, a real-life Benedict Arnold, your very own Judas, as the greatest form of betrayal is betrayal to oneself. You've convinced it was everybody else, but it's really self-sabotage. 
It doesn't matter what those are, but those are real things that you can come into agreement with which the devil hasn't even touched you yet. Due to our upbringing, our teachers, preachers, our belief system that we've created all around that we're operating in fear because of agreement, which allows the second part of the coin, which I'm gonna talk about right now, which is the spirit of fear. It's a temperamental beast. It's built for a fight. It works mentally to wear you down and will not be vanquished quickly unless prayer and deliverance. It's an amazing thing. We gotta break out of our comfort zone. We gotta wrestle fear into submission. We must decide that what you want is bigger, brighter, and far more beautiful than the fear which prevents you from achieving it. God's destiny, God's purpose, God's plan for your life, we must recognize that it's bigger than the fear that enables us. How do I know what happens is when you get around big people, you either shrink back because of fear or you say, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me, and you step into it. I'm telling you, it's a safe place here. Men's prayer is a safe place to talk about men's stuff. Women's prayer is a safe place to talk about women's stuff. Sometimes we gotta get around our boys to get some breakthrough, to just have some admitting. It's amazing we can be bravado, machismo, whatever it is to put that thing up there But behind it all, we just want to bust this thing, and we can if you can be vulnerable enough. Yeah, you want to know the title of my message. Okay, fine, the will to act. (laughs) We have to have the will to act. When we move, God moves. And that's what the understanding is. In virtually every case, the decision to rise to meet a challenge and face your fears boil down to the desire for greater freedom, for greater peace of mind, and the uh, opportunity to unleash your greatness. Listen, on the other side of fear is happiness. On the other side of fear is courage. On the other side of fear is love. On the other side of fear is confidence. On the other side of fear is strength. On the other side of fear is security. On the other side of fear, all your hopes, your dreams, all your goals, all your deepest desires that God created you to walk in and have fruit and bear the fruit in. I love this, what's your God dream? Isaiah 43, one, don't fear. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. If you know Jesus, that's your scripture. If you don't, step one, know Jesus. I love it. So what is your challenge for today? I just want you to start thinking, what are those one through eights that I'm gonna receive prayer for tonight? If you didn't resonate with any of them, great. We'll see your fruit. It's evident. That's why I love being around Pastor Juergen. Even, now, this doesn't mean you're immune to fear. It's just you don't come into agreement with fear. Right. We will all have fear at every challenge, but who's around you matters. Right. Who's around you to talk through that fear, to process that fear, to understand that fear. As a parent, I want to process fear with my kids, not let them get stuck in it where they come to their own conclusion, which creates a limiting self-belief and a ceiling over their life, which then opens the door for the enemy then to prey on my kids. See, we're all God's kids, and he wants to arm us, equip us, and give it to us. And listen, the answer is a person. I love this. God's answer to fear is not an argument or a formula. It's a person. It's Jesus. That's why he said to Abraham, fear not. I am your shield. God himself is the final answer to every fear that as the human heart has. The answer is Jesus. Our God is Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider. Listen, have you ever wondered why God called himself by the name I am in the Old Testament? Above all else, it means that God is eternally existent and therefore all creation depends on him. God stands alone. No one can be compared to him. He is complete in himself. God doesn't need us, but we desperately need him. He created us in his likeness. I love this. Paul wrote the story about Abraham in Romans 4, 19 through 21. He says, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. See, the revelation is, what do you believe in God's word? Do you believe it's for you? Or is the devil convinced you otherwise? 
He went on to say, I am your shield. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. This is Genesis 15, one. So it, I love this because Paul referenced in Romans. But if you go to Genesis 15, one, it says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid. So what was he? The father of faith was afraid. He didn't stop there. He said, I am your shield, your very great reward. Abram had many reasons, by the way. He was very old, okay? I don't even know how he hooked up with Sarah. (laughs) Many years had passed since the promise. Some of you have been holding out on a promise for years. Abraham had a promise. It was years, like 20-something years later. He was already old at 80. But he was still unwavering, fully persuaded at 100 still. God's got this. And then people say, well, it's never happened before. Well, it never happened before Abraham too, people. But because of his agreement, it went generations. Sarah also doubted God's promise. He even had a wife that was a doubter. So he had everything going against him. Never happened before. He was super old. The promise was like expired. And his wife wasn't hanging out going, yeah, I think this is possible. So when you think about it, there was no reason to believe No reason to accept that God had promised to do what he did. The question is simple. Will God promise to be enough for Abraham? To all our fears, God said, I am your shield. What I love about it, the answer to that question, I am your shield, God declares. He didn't say, look, I'm gonna give you a shield. He said, I am your shield. When we think of shield, maybe it's a little shield. Maybe a Captain America shield. No, no, it's a full shield. And what I love about this is we got to understand this shield cannot be defeated. It's as strong as God himself. It was a promise. What I love about this, if God is your shield, fear not. But you have to break the agreement that the devil's been lying that you're not even worthy of a shield. You are worthy. You're God's kids. You have the shield. The devil's a liar. And you remind him that I have the shield. And I want to give you Psalm 18 too. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. Think of it this way. To say that God is great, I am, means that when you, we come into him, he is everything we need exactly at that moment. It's as if God is saying, I am your strength. I am your courage. I am your health. I am your hope. I am your supply. I am your defender. I am your deliverer. I am your forgiveness. I am your joy. I am your future. God is saying to you and me, I am whatever you need whenever you need it. He is the all-sufficient God for every crisis. What are you agreeing with? We got to know that we play our part. God's shield means two specific things. He protects us in times of doubt. He rescues us in times of danger. We gotta remember that God's gonna do his part if we do our part. What I want you to understand is the power of agreement is everything. I never knew that. I heard Mike Connell come in and he was talking about all these agreements. And if you don't know who Mike Connell is, listen, he's coming to church. He's gonna be around for like a month training up all our leadership teams on deliverance, on prayer. I mean, you're gonna see this place level up. If you've never seen it, you're about to see it. But I want you to be encouraged because if we have the revelation of who our God is, we will walk in that freedom. Knowing that what we say has power over our life. Sometimes we can get stirred up. It's now not getting stirred up. It's not the fear that is the issue. It's what are you coming into agreement or alignment with that will then become a control switch in your life that will dominate your thought. That's why God says you have to renew your mind. You have to take every thought captive. You cannot get stuck and rehearse and curse your own life because that gives a foothold to the enemy to rule and reign in your life. So what I want to do, I'm going to pray for us. I prayed for our entire ministry team in the green room. And what I want to let you know is that there is freedom from every stinking thinking negative report that we can think whatever. But if we don't take authority over our mind tonight, we're going to walk out these doors having the same thoughts and feeling that fear come over us. It's analysis paralysis. Where is their fear? I have a lot of pastoral meetings. I'm going to tell you there's a lot of fear around money. 
There's, because it has to do with our security. Sometimes it has to do with our identity. Sometimes there's a lot of fear around relationships. See, it leads to this anxiety. If you suffer with anxiety, depression, it's not a judgment. It's just let's get set free from it. What I want to do, I want us to all stand to our feet, and I'm just going to pray for us. And while I pray, and I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. Because I want us to have an encounter. When you have an encounter, one drop from heaven can change everything. What happens is that when you come into this agreement, you start to feel fear. It's a tangible, it's a real thing. Depression is a real thing until you get set free from it. One drop from heaven, I've watched people completely restored, never to have an anxious thought again with one prayer. Now, if you leave here and a thought comes up, you just have to say, God, thank you for my healing. Devil, you're a liar. I'm set free in the name of Jesus. This isn't, this isn't like hype 101. It's power. So if you resonated with any of those eight statements, I want you to come down to the altar and I'm going to pray for you. Because I want to just have a move and then I'm going to pray. I'm going to let the worship team worship. If you need prayer, and here's the difference. How bad do you want your life of desires and dreams? Are you willing to come down to receive prayer. Right now, you could have the devil in your ear going, oh, that's not fro are you. Or your heart is beating 100 miles an hour. It's amazing that why would your heart beat 100 miles an hour? Why would your physiology change unless there was an enemy that wanted to keep you in lack, wanted to keep you playing small, wanted to keep you in self-doubt and disbelief? See, this isn't just for you. This is for a world that desperately needs to know people that know the answer. Jesus is the answer. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our pastors, team, and what we do at C3 San Diego, go to C3SanDiego.com.